Hello everyone and um, welcome to the director's room. My name is Gudrun Sole Sigurdóttir and I am here with the four fourth year directors and I'm delighted to welcome you all here. Um, I am one of the mentors on the directing reimagining classic text module alongside Josh Armstrong and I'm here today with the four fourth year directors Dan, Jan, Julia and Minnie and I'm very much looking forward to them sharing their thoughts and reflections with you all in this discussion today. I will start today's director's room by giving you a bit of context about the module. We will then have the directors introduce themselves and we will then open up for a discussion, which you are very welcome to be part of by engaging with the conversation through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or the chat box um, at the bottom of your screen. And we will be aiming to finish by 5 p.m. today. So thank you once again for being here with us and I hope that you have all enjoyed the Propel Festival so far. Um, this module, di Directing Reimagining Classic Text, is a collaboration between fourth and first year students where they engage in the making of an original performance working within the structure of a director-led process using classic text as a stimulus. The four directors, which you can see here on the screen with me, they were all given the same text, Twelfth Night by William Shakespeare, and have developed four original adaptations. And under normal circumstances, these students would be working towards a live performance presented in the Chandler Theatre at the Royal Conservatoire. But this year, because of the lockdown restrictions and the current public health crisis, this process has been entirely online. So the four directing students have responded to this with imaginative solutions and innovative ways of engaging in a collaborative process from their living rooms, resulting in four new performances created for digital platforms. So this is the director's room, which is a space for weekly discussions with the fourth year directing students, where we share directing practices, reflect on collaborative performance making, and ask questions that arise in the process. And we want to invite you to join us in today's discussion. Um, but before we go any further, I'm just going to pass it on to the directors for them to introduce themselves. Dan. Thanks, Gudrun. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, uh, my name is Dan Brown. Um, I'm originally from Blackburn, West Lovian. Uh, which is the hometown to Susan Boyle. So you definitely know where that is. Um, I studied H&D acting and performance at Edinburgh College and I graduated in 2015. Um, and then I took a year out and then I joined this course in September of 2016. Um, so I guess now I would say that I am a multidisciplinary performance artist and director um, and on this course I've been able to really work on my practice and figure that out so yeah I usually make work that draws on the theatrical um, I utilize persona and popular iconography to contextualize meaning and mediate autobiography um, and I usually do this through performance is my main way of doing it but I also look at film and um, video art, which is what House, which is on tomorrow, um, is. Um, and I also use multimedia projection within performance as well. Um, yes, this is me. Hi, uh, my name is Genevieve Jagger, and I am a cyborg performance artist and writer. Um, the show that I have brought to Propel Festival is called Twelfth Net, and it is uh, a website performance, basically. Um, I'm really, really interested in, yeah, in the internet and in having been the first generation, I guess, to grow up fully in the in the age of the internet and have all of all facets of my identity informed by the internet. Um, yeah, and I'm in, interested in all of the little, the little nooks and crannies on the web um, that we find ourselves in. Um, yeah. Hi, 
Hi, um, I'm Julia Fisher. Uh, I also directed a show. Um, uh, my show is called Matrimony. It is a intergalactic uh, celebrity drag wedding. Um, and I don't, I should have prepared for this question probably as I knew it was being asked. Uh, but also I think I kind of center my practice around not using big words and pretending like I'm important because I don't think I am. Um, you know, Dan may describe himself as uh, multidisciplinary. I just describe myself as bad at doing a lot of different things. Um, I like having fun with things. I don't want to take things too seriously, but I also want to question things and challenge things and make things uh, come at you from as many different angles. Uh, I think a core of um, matrimony is coming from like queerness and questioning what uh, ceremonies and uh, kind of traditional structures of our communities can look like through the lens of alienness and also what alienness is in itself. Uh, we've kind of been very inspired by like 60s B-movies and Doctor Who and Star Trek where, you know, you look at someone and they say, this is an alien because we've told you it's an alien. And I think that's a, a question that I think is quite interesting to look at, especially from like a queer theory lens. And it was yesterday and will be again occurring on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Hi everybody, um, I'm Minnie Crook. Um, I have directed um, the show One Man Shows uh, with three first years. Um, and uh, yeah, I would say that I'm a multidisciplinary artist <laughs> um, and director now, I guess, in Glasgow. Um, my practice has usually explored uh, memory and nostalgia um, to investigate kind of my personal histories and my autobiography and uh, the physical distance between myself and my family um, in England and Ireland. Um, my work typically uses uh, visual projection, persona and a cappella song um, to further understand the past as irretrievable moments in time. Um, Alongside this, I am interested in what is present and absent, uh, the art of forgetting and the processes of remembering. Um, and yeah, and ultimately how we are all shaped by uh, the societal maneuverings of the world. Um, so that's me, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, it feels very exciting that we're opening up this director's room um, to an audience. And I'm just gonna remind you once again, for those of you who just joined us, that you can engage with this conversation through the Q&A box or through the chat. So please feel free to ask any questions and we will weave them into our discussion. Um, I just want to start off today by asking you and, and to hear your reflections on how you approached working on this collaborative process in a pandemic when, when you and your collaborators were all in separate spaces. And I know that this was a big challenge for all of us to figure out how, how this would run in this way. So um, would any of you would be willing to talk a little bit about what your approach was and maybe maybe some of your discoveries along the way? I can start at least. I'm sure we've all got different perspectives on this, especially given that we've been working with different people and in different media. But um, yeah, I think Maybe it's kind of a core of, of, of everything I've worked with beyond it, but I think um, one of the biggest components is less so the physical restraints I found, which are obviously challenging, but they're kind of immediate and obvious in many ways. And I think going, oh, we've got to be making a show on the internet and now we're communicating through Skype. And that can be kind of challenging in certain regards, but I think the biggest uh, hurdle that I found and, and was most complicated to, um, uh, surmount was kind of one of access and um, accessibility in all senses, <clears throat> excuse me, and I think especially in terms of mental health uh, in both uh, myself and my participants and managing the kind of sudden lack of a network and the kind of constant emotional and psychological labour of like every communication we have being through um, either a kind of compromised text medium or a very exhausting um, video call, you know, you can't 
have the same length of a rehearsal and so managing all of those things and, and trying as much as possible to be like okay is this useful if not we can leave and I think that was one of the things that I think um, was a big learning point and I think that's something that I tried to put in the core of, of everything I do especially when working with other people of just being like this is not and um, one of the things that when we started, we had to make a presentation as to what we kind of like wanted to, to approach our directing process from. And I think that's one of the things that I uh, kind of want to bring into a core of everything I do is that like art making can and should be enjoyable and a pleasurable experience. And I think that's one of the things that is very often the hardest thing to remember, especially, you know, in the most recent weeks where we've been like running up to a tech and, and I've spent, you know, eight hours a day solidly sitting in front of a computer editing video and then you know it's been very nice to then come back and be like no but this is an enjoyable process and we should be enjoying ourselves to make it um, and so that's been one of the things I think yeah managing people's health as well and also using that in turn to acknowledge kind of pre-existing um, circumstances of like you know if, if people have certain you know if they're dyslexic they already weren't going to be uh, as easily accessible and into your emails or you know whatever and so yeah really bringing accessibility before has been something that's been quite important for me at least yeah it feels like it's been like um there's had to be a lot of questioning about uh the kind of capitalist structures that surround artists um and capitalist pressures on i mean our group also engaged with like a lot of queer theory i'm a queer artist also um <laughs> and yeah so I, I feel like I'm resonating with that in terms of yeah so these these circles of marginalized people who tend to have a higher prevalence of um disabled or neuro neurodivergent individuals and I guess yeah it's been a lot of in analyzing the capitalist values that I have held myself against as an artist so I mean, it's been incredibly counterintuitive to be like, well, I can work on this directly with my group for maybe two hours, but usually more like an hour and a half per day. I don't think I've ever engaged in an artistic process where that's the amount of time I spend on, on the work daily or not even daily, because it's also been like, well, because we have other classes on, I, we can't do weekends. So, and then maybe we need a break midweek. So maybe it's four days a week of an hour and a half a day which goes against everything that I feel like I, I think about art as being. I feel like um, the anxiety of that has has made me have to have a look at like um, the, yeah the, the image we have of artists of people who go in to some place and be there for 12 hours and it doesn't relent and you can't stop thinking about it and um, yeah, so I, I found I had a lot of guilt about my, my productivity. Um, and I guess I never realized I thought of art making as uh, an issue of productivity. And I realized that um, that guilt made, was a very capitalist thing. It made me feel like I was being frivolous or a bad capitalist worker when actually what was happening was I was looking after myself and my participants. Um, yeah, it's made me think a lot about the, the way we exploit ourselves within art, sometimes in terms of autobiography, sometimes in terms of time and effort, or this idea that art making hurts us. Um, and it's, yeah, it's been counterintuitive, but a big learning curve to engage in a process where it's like, well, none of us can take any more hurt. So this process has to not, has to, yeah, just has to not hurt us. Um. Yeah, I think, I think for me, I think I'm, uh, agree with Den, Den, Jen about, um, the kind of, uh, hours that you're limited to, to kind of make, um, make this work in. And I think that was a, yeah, a real shock for me as well in terms of, um, changing complete routines and having to be totally fully prepared to go into an hour session, um, two hour session and, um, yeah, feeling like, you have achieved, you've gone way beyond what you had expected to achieve in that two hours, or you haven't uh, achieved as as much as you had wanted to. Um, for me, I think quite early on, I I was interested in how we communicate and how we present ourselves. I think um, 
everybody's now online or we're all confined to this square um and yeah what is presentable um and what do other people gauge of me um because we're not in the same space and because you can see me from kind of my neck up you know um how do we how do we still have these interactions with people or how do we still communicate in a way that feels um meaningful and yeah my whole arts practice i think is about communication in a sense and um having these interactions and um yeah building relationships with people and that was kind of my um vision for this module um which i don't think i I don't think I've missed out on. I still feel like I've got to know kind of the people I've been working with really well, um, even though we we don't know what each other look like um, in real person, you know. Um, so, but it's really, yeah, it's really shown me that we rely on, yeah, body language and communication so much. Um, yeah, which is why I think that um, I was interested in that um, and working online. Um, I think I'll be really honest and say that I didn't want to do it um, at the start. Um, the Easter break was definitely a time for me to yeah, really try and figure that out just because I sort of, you know, being on the course for four years and having such an excellent time and directing in, in my own first year, I like really built up an, an idea in my head of what I wanted to do and what, where I wanted to go with it. and. To really be in the room with everyone after a very solo process um, with Into the New, um, to then go back into a room and work with people and move and dance. And I was really excited for that. And then obviously it, it didn't happen. So I was, yeah, really had a lot of talking to myself to try and figure out how I could keep enjoying it. Um, and yeah, definitely the struggles are like in terms of making the work, because we, yeah, I'm only doing two hour Zoom classes, three times a week, maybe, which is the equivalent to like a day and a half almost. So once I had made this plan in my my brain of where it was gonna go and how we we're gonna to get to the show week, by the time we got into the third week, it was like, oh, actually this isn't working because we're not doing the same process actually. Um, and it was like, okay, now we need to reconfigure all that again <laughs> and try and figure out what's the next part because it's actually very confusing um and yeah i am also in terms of keeping ourselves healthy during this time i really struggled during this time um as a person um i i haven't i've just gone outside like two weeks ago for the first time in like a month um you know it's been really hard for me to be like in this space the whole time but and, and also be directing and be um a sort of leading figure but I just, I've just really taken the time to sort of, if things are getting too much, to just actually just drop it and go play video games or do something that I enjoy, which might seem a bit counterproductive, but actually in this time is probably the most beneficial thing. So yeah, I think there's been a lot of learning about, yeah, looking after yourself as well, which has been pretty massive. Um, yes. Um, thank you, everyone. I think it's really interesting to hear you talk about um, the importance of care for yourselves and for your performance in this process and, the, and, and how unexpected this was for all of you having to respond in this way. Um, you've, you've already started to talk about this a little bit in terms of some of the limitations that, that you had in the process, in terms of the time you had with the people you were working with. You didn't know your performers um, to a great deal and you were kind of uh, confined to this um, throughout the whole process. So I'm curious to know um, more about what the limitations were, but also what were the possibilities that, that you encountered in this new way of working? And I know from some of the platforms that you're engaging with, or with some of the ways that you're, you build your performances, you were able to construct them and kind of keep the material in a different way to a live performance, perhaps. Um, yeah, so what, what were some of the possibilities that were opened up? Um, I mean, for me, Twelfth Net has been a huge amount of unpicking the rules of the internet. Um, when we first started working together, obviously, I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of Zoom and Microsoft Teams calls, and I'll be doing it throughout this video where it's like, 
the box and I can see myself up in the corner. Um, and I, yeah, everyone does this thing where, uh, because there's no, there's no physical presence, you try and perform presence. And so you, you like, you nod and you smile a lot. And then there's a jarring thing in terms of like delay in, and vocals um, where you can't interrupt each other um, or naturally segue between what you're saying and people start talking and then they don't and then they get like, I mean, I was doing it when Gudrun was asking the question, get really stressed about when do I click on mute and am I going to cut Gudrun off and I can't, yeah, she can't visually see me in order to be like, Jen's going to have something to say or, or yeah, all of those things felt really hard. So in the end, we, um, yeah, we decided to to give give them up and we decided to give up politeness and for the first half of our performance making process we um engaged anonymously so all of my performers created anonymous emails and anonymous identities and on various platforms anonymous accounts on which they could upload the work um and so when i was giving tasks or talking about work i didn't know who i was talking to and i didn't know who i was receiving from and then in terms of the live and how we collaborated what we did was we used google docs um where we would be able to look at a document but there has a chat box feature and so my artists would come in anonymously and uh, they could type and that meant that they could interrupt each other and they could follow each other so much better because they weren't stressed about listening or listening face or how to speak or when to speak um and so they could just like batter into the chat and then also through doing that and then through engaging with this anonymous internet identity which I feel I've yeah across years um enjoyed myself in the most uh, in terms of like MMO RPG games and things like this uh we found that that actually enabled creativity in a way that being in a room together sometimes doesn't where you feel insecure about your idea or that it feels personal or really attached to you whereas I feel like there's this way when you speak when you type and when you type quickly um and when you you don't type officially in terms of like emails and things that that pushed the whole thing somewhere else um so even yeah we got to a point where my performers are being like oh my god lol and like pulling links from across the web and being like yeah it's this it's this exact thing or there was little like buttons on things it was e really easy to see how people felt and that made it really clear on how we yeah built a, a group creative consciousness basically um i think for me um I was really interested in trying to replicate some form of rehearsal room and rehearsal space and yeah mourning this loss of bodies in a space and working with people um I kind of came into the process wanting to um respond to my first year artists I think that they yeah I think I have more ideas uh, when I'm when I'm responding to um other people in a space um, so yeah, I was obsessed with trying to create some form of rehearsal room um, in the easiest way possible online. So I think I stayed with Zoom as like a platform and we kept working with Zoom um, and quite quickly I wanted to create an illusion that we were all in the same space. I wanted it to feel like um, all the performers looked like they were in the same room. Um, and uh, we kind of, for a few weeks, explored this idea of passing, passing things through a screen uh, to another performer. Um, and evidently that, that didn't uh, manifest in the final thing because it's so, such a challenge to kind of work with these pre-organized pre platforms that don't let you, uh, yeah, manipulate where the boxes are and things like that. So um, yeah, for me, it was really important that we were playing with this idea of being in the same room and being and being together even though we weren't um and i think that kind of stems from my own practice in terms of distance uh between myself and family members and this idea of yeah um the fact that i'm in glasgow and one of my performers is in amsterdam and that that idea of wanting to feel like we were together and um yeah feeling or even if it is an illusion allow allow that pretense to allow us to 
um, pretend for a moment that we're together um, or that we're sharing the same experience in some way. So that was really important for me um, in terms of that. I think just bouncing off of that as well, I think sharing and excuse me, sharing an experience is something that's like super important to me in terms of like arts practice. I think that's like, because I think after kind of everything got shut down, I was like a, a kind of reassessment point. And I think, yeah, one of the reasons I'm making performances is just because this is where I am, but it's like the act of liveness and being, um, having some kind of simultaneous experience is something that's like very important to me and very uh, engaging for the way that I like I'm excited by art. And so that was one of the things that was like quite disheartening in terms of like the way that I wanted to make things. And initially when we started the process, I was I was kind of intending to be as untechnological as possible, uh, which ended up not happening in any capacity. Um, but yeah, and also I think that was a, a massive complication of like adapting to those spaces uh, and working out how things can be live. Cause like as much as this right now is live, in many ways, there's there's not a huge amount um, that varies it than if we'd all just pre-filmed this. And that's one of the things that I really didn't want to have happen. And I wanted something that genuinely feels live, which is why the performance, for those of you that haven't seen it, is is, is partially pre-recorded and partially live. And we bring audience members in and uh, they join in with a call. And yeah, I think that's just like a really important thing. Because I think one of the things for me in terms of, of, of losing theatre, like I've, I've watched a bunch of shows where they're just essentially just showing me a, a film that was filmed on a small stage with a live audience, which isn't necessarily very interesting because that's not the way that it was meant to be seen. Uh, and so that was a big thing to try and sort out a manner in which like things can feel genuinely live and responsive in some capacity. Um, so that was, kind of what we were going for um, and I think I had another point but I can't remember what it was so I will stop there. Um, yeah I think I'm like, resonating with what everyone is saying I think we're all are on the same page of wanting the liveness aspect do you know I feel like that was we're all really longing for that and whenever we're having conversations and things um, and you know I yeah I mentioned that I wanted everyone to to be in the room dancing together and that was like my real biggest intention so I was like how do I keep that going when we're in squares how is that possible so yeah we looked at the choreographer's handbook by Jonathan Burroughs as a starting point to just get moving and try things out and then very quickly I was able to when I, once I made the decision that it was going to be a piece of video art I guess that was when the technology became an, became an asset because in terms of directing I was um, asking my collaborators to make the make the material to make the work and then I literally would direct it in terms of taking it and molding it into the way that it was to create dancing together in a space as much as possible through this through this way so yeah, it feels like at first everything felt really heavy and like loads and loads and loads of barriers and then once I just made the decision as to what it was and what it is everything sort of opened up from there which but that, that took time that took a long time <laughs> but um yeah once I got there it was like really good and it's I mean I I, I edit quite a lot and I, I'm quite good at it and I enjoy it and it's but in, in, the, in a directing module it's it's just funny because it's like the real meaning of the word to, you know, like literally like place things where I want them to go <laughs> instead of people. Uh, so yeah, I thought, I just think that's, that's funny. It's also like this thing of um, realizing how many rules we unconsciously follow with technology and what, what technology can do and what technology looks like. Um, so with 12th net, we were responding quite heavily to um, two pieces of web art. So uh, 12th Net takes its its name as a little nod to a piece called Hamnet, which was a, a chat room performance of Hamlet. Um, and then also a piece called Mushay.org, which uh, was like, a, it's a website. It's like kind of about the endlessness of identity. Um, 
expressed through the endlessness of web pages, basically. Um, but I realized that both of these web arts were made in uh, the like the 90s, so the kind of uh, the more beginning stages of the internet. And then I found that looking across the years, uh, things things become become a bit more like a single tone, I guess. So it was like why why when I'm looking for ways that the internet has been pushed into like why do I have to look back to the 90s? The internet is like in so many parts of our, our lives. Technology is like so constant and it has become part of who we are. Like why, yeah, why do I have to look back to the 90s to see how that's been used m differently or more innovatively? And so like there was this certain rules about the internet and about the screen and about what you can put on screen and what is aesthetic and what is not aesthetic and like even when it came down to like well what font am i using like there's so many unconscious rules about like what font it is like it's it's calibri times new roman for some reason it's not comic sans like all of these rules or there has to be if it's a website there has to be a header and there has to be buttons and there has to be a scroll button um and i guess i was wondering what happened to in, yeah, in performance, we're asked to figure these things out on our own. And so it was it was a lot of work to unpick all of these things. So my my yeah, my performers would come to me with these web pages and they would have like a back button and a go button and it would all be very clear. And it was it yeah, it we had to ban all of these concepts because it's like, well, people will click and they'll figure it out for themselves, and that's part of the thrill of it. And so yeah. Um, like going forward, I hope that being pushed out of our comfort zones, um, yeah, pushes us as artists as well in order to, yeah, to stop following all of these rules that are kind of implemented by like very, again, capitalist patriarchal structures and big corporations about what the internet looks like. Um, and it was, it's been fun to return to this like amateur aesthetic that is, um, yeah, of, of people who don't own the internet, I guess. <laughs> I think that's a very um, good point, Genevieve, about how how to remain playful and how to how to keep pushing the platforms. And I'm interested in how all of you responded in one way or another when talking about possibilities, is talking about the the possibilities of of connecting with your performers or connecting with the audience, the possibilities of of making this look like a shared space or an invitation to the audience or making it appear like we're being in outer space and, and we're moving between lots of different images. So I guess, um, yeah, I'm just I'm just fascinated by, by the attempt within it and how that pushes those platforms that are often not built for live performance and you're having to find roundabout ways of, of achieving your aesthetic or achieving that, that sense of connection with the audience. Um, we've just had a question through to us from Florence, who is asking, how do you think your new founded focus on care and mental health of you and your fellow artists will impact your practice post COVID-19? Um, thank you very much. That's a great question, Florence. And I think it really, um, really connects with what you've all been saying already in terms of trying to make this sustainable for you and your performers and and your care and your consideration um for the process so who would like to go i think it's one of those things where it's i i hopefully at least um try and keep that to the core of like all of my practices in everything that i do and i think a big thing really is is that um as much as you know I will continue to work with disabled people, you know, I have done for my entire life. They are in every aspect of society. I think the biggest thing is um, that hopefully institutions will allow for that flexibility. Because I think that's one of the things that's like, uh, you know, we were working for two hours a day. And um, for plenty of artists, that's, I imagine, a, a very comfortable way to be working. Plenty of artists, you know, are not in a position to leave the house every single day. And I wonder, especially in terms of the context of, of this institution, how much that can continue and how many um, students, you know, could, could actually uh, enhance their uh, education and, and the learning that they can make uh, from being uh, allowed these capacities, which, like, obviously they have compromised a lot of aspects of our learning, but I wonder... Um, 
Uh, sorry, I was distracted by that uh, question from Craig there. Um, but um, yes, I wonder, yeah, how much um, moving forward, whether, you know, um, a student can say, um, I will not be able to come physically into the building today, but I can still engage in the learning and how much how much that um, can continue, because I know that has, um, from, you know, the experience of the last four years, not necessarily been the case historically. And I wonder, you know, what all of us can learn as an institution moving forward as well. Um, and I really hope that that can move forward. And I think as well, like a lot of that is in terms of resources and in terms of experience, like these things are complicated. And I think um, it's a shame that it was a crisis that took it to learn us. But like, you know, I have spent the last term working out how to um, interface with all of these uh, technologies and it is complicated and it does take d different kinds of focuses in different kind of contexts. And so like, I totally understand why maybe these resources haven't been used prior, but I think, yeah, I think now everybody knows how Zoom works. Everybody is used to staying at home and, and, and communicating to people in different spaces on different time zones. And I wonder, yeah, how much can this move forward on every level rather than just individual artistics? Uh, yeah, I have to agree with that. I think, um, yeah, the whole world is going through this, you know, I, and I, I remind myself that it's not just me that's uh, feeling down this today. Um, everybody must be feeling down at some point during this whole thing. And one thing that I think, well, the prospect of graduating into kind of a paused industry feels really daunting and feels, uh, yeah, quite terrifying. Um, but actually what's what's kind of interesting is that everybody is going through that um, and everything will take will come back slowly and we can then choose how how these things reframe themselves and come back into into the society that we knew before knew prior and i feel like this marks this can mark perhaps a a change in how we think and how we make work and how yeah how accessible it is um who benefits from it i think i've had lots of conversations with people who haven't really um yeah been aware of what i do or what i've been doing for the past four years on the course and this has been the opportunity for me to kind of begin to talk about what art is for me and how i approach it and actually it's if anything this pandemic has made room for those conversations to begin and for us to reframe how we might um move into the to the industry that once existed in a different way um yeah bearing in mind kind of um pace of work as well i, I like during into the new i was working kind of exhaustive hours and crashing in bed and then getting up again and doing it again part of me absolutely loves that and 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 wouldn't wish to be doing anything else um but again yeah we have to be aware that um yeah is that healthy or is that something that well personally i don't think artists can can sustain that type of exhaustion um and then working online it's a completely different exhaustion that you're still working long hours um but it's a completely different kind of eye strain um soreness instead of um physical body um so yeah i think it will really kind of mark a a different mindset moving into uh, the industry again um positively i think and i think us as kind of graduating artists will be able to kind of uh make these decisions and and kind of manipulate how this new industry re-envisaged re industry might look um for the better i think anyway yeah i think there's something about um maintaining that health in like financially as well because uh making web art is quite is a very cheap way to make art uh it's also a very cheap way to like access art like there was a, a moment in our process where we were so at that po point we were working in just a chat room and we were intending to just make a show in a chat room before it became a website uh, and we were talking about set and i guess we we got this idea that oh because it's all written the set can just be literally anything and nobody can challenge us on that it just is or we can source images on these like um stock image websites and be like oh we want that desk and we want this and that can just like be um 
so sorry, I was just uh, spotting uh, Craig Manson's question in the, the Q&A thing and kind of going off the back of this in terms of like, how will we maintain health and how will we like keep going? Like I, I intend to keep, to keep making web art and realizing that when I make art on the internet, um, I don't need to be funded necessarily to make it. I can go anywhere and do anything. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of free resource that hasn't, I don't think been recognized before. Um, yeah. I think, um, I think those discussions are all very interesting and, and perhaps you've already started to answer um, a question that just came through the chat box from Madi, which is, can we reframe and begin a process focusing on new and or healthy practices without focusing on the preconception that the process might be harmful and the battle against that? Is it possible for a practice of art making to fully transcend existing structures rather than focusing on the opposition to them? Or do you think the opposition to them is inherent in transcending them? And I think, yeah, I'm interested in, in what you were talking about in terms of um, both in terms of the platform, but also in terms of, of in terms of this sort of s some form of a level playing field that you're maybe encountering now. And you sh and you and you did for sure at the start of your process where you and your performers were having to figure out how do we navigate this space? How do we set up a rehearsal room? And maybe once you graduate, you're going to be figuring that out with festival promoters and producers and venues and and other um, artists and, and how do you sustain a practice with social distance, distancing measures, measures or online. Um, so I'm just curious to know, yeah, do you think the opposition to them is inherent in transcending them or, or do you think, yeah, what's your thought on that? I think there's, um, I, this hasn't necessarily come up in the, this process in itself, um, but I think Jen, you've talked about it the most and also partially many as well. There is a kind of a geographic um, ownership of space, especially that is incredibly alive uh, within the world of technology. Um, and I think it's something that I've wor worked on and talked a lot about before is, is that like in terms of a lot more in terms of physical space rather than digital space, but like um, this um, application is owned, you know, most of the communications we've been using have been going through um, Microsoft and particularly in terms of what's going on in the Black Lives Matter uh, protests that have been going on just now, there's been a lot of discussion about where can we have a safe discussion? Where can we have a space in which we can organize ourselves and, 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 and protest the violence that's being placed upon us that is not owned and is not going to be uh, sold out to other forces? For example, Zoom in itself uh, has explicitly stated that they um, will not encrypt their files against the FBI. Um, for people who are trying to organize over Zoom. So that is kind of corporate interests uh, purposefully exclaiming that they uh, will not support you. Um, and I think that's also still true in theaters, you know. Um, you know, all of these uh, kind of uh, Victorian or older institutions that have been owned by kings and plantation owners, like there is a kind of history of um, corporatism that is owned, that, uh, um, <laughs> Uh, that is, yeah, uh, uh, in the ways that all of our art venues are owned, and um, so too are the digital spaces on which we are working. And so I think there is some level of uh, constant fighting that we should be um, making towards the, the, the buildings that we exist in and also kind of uh, reclaiming the land that we as human beings own and have, um, and communities sh should have access to and kind of uh, allowing art to exist uh, beyond those borders of like the theatre who has commissioned you just as kind of Jen was talking about with websites being uh, effectively free or slightly more free than um, a commissioning gallery would be and I think there's something you know I, I've made a lot of work in terms of like um, de um, mystifying and de uh, reifying the whole role of an artist and the role of an art space and I think that's really important to be like uh, you know my street just now is, is covered in chalk drawings by children, um, which has been like a constant regular pro, uh, piece of art that I've, I've seen every single time I've gone outside that has been constantly evolving and changing and like uh, is a piece of community owned art, despite the fact that if anybody, you know, in any more um, kind of industrial process um, was to like put art on the pavement, 
uh, the council would scrub that away, the police may be called, you know, that person might be arrested or fined or whatever for vandalism. And I think there's something, yeah, in terms of like, it's, it, there is no neutral space, all spaces owned or controlled by someone at this point. And so I think if you are making art that exists in any physical space, which it does, it's kind of impossible to make art that also isn't um, within some other higher um, hierarchical structure. And I think so, yeah, it's kind of impossible to not be uh, in some way protesting a space that you exist in because all space is owned in the present world. Um, thank you very much, Julia. I am um, just aware of time, so I'm just going to move us on to the next question. So we've had a question through from Craig Manson, who is asking, what parts of your directing practice that you've had to adapt for an online process would you continue doing with people physically in a rehearsal room, if any? Um, really good question, Craig. Um, and this maybe leads to my question as well, which was going to be about, um, obviously the lockdown is kind of slowly easing and although this process that you just engaged with had to be digital there were opportun there will be opportunities in the in the near future or, or future at some point um to go back to making in spaces together so i'm just curious and and linking that to craig's question about what practices you would like to continue in rooms with people but also do you see yourself using digital platforms when it is no longer necessary and i know that You've already reflected on that a little bit, um, Genevieve. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was, I was just touching on that. Um, I mean, I definitely, um, I think there's something in rebelling against the systems of the internet that has drawn me to the idea of like objection and disgustingness and grossness. Um, and I, yeah, I guess I've, I've realized that I, find it more interesting when I lean into disgust than when I lean into beauty. Um, and it feels more disruptive to be gross than it does to be, um, to yeah, to be pretty. So rather than like in, with Toss Night, rather than having like a beautiful accessible web page, you have like a really like icky click hole where you make one wrong click and then suddenly you're looking at pictures of like people's feet and like all of like, this energy, I feel like I'm, I want to work out how that translates onto stage. Um, and also, uh, I think there's something about stepping away from autobiography, um, which is, is a difficult one, I guess, because every, I think everything we do is always embedded in autobiography. So it's not as such ignoring our personal identities. But I, I think I realized through this process, how much of, yeah, going back to this thing about how we hurt ourselves through art, of how much of myself and things, things of me that hurt and, and are really tender, I've been pressing on in order to, to make something poignant or something interesting. Um, so with Twelfth Night, there's, you can't know any of my performers by watching that piece. And for me, that has been incredibly refreshing. And so I'm, I'm interested in, in um, yeah, making a performance making performance after this all ends that doesn't make me not want to look my audience members in the eye afterwards and doesn't make me want to shrivel up when people when people comment on it um and i guess yeah of knowing what what of me is in that but only me knowing that there's something about like secrecy and a not and like anonymity that feels uh like a relief yeah there's something interesting about um yeah, be anonymous or yeah, I don't think in my in my show anybody kind of introduces themselves, but then we're just using names as normal as like kind of a conversational piece. Um, yeah, so it's kind of interesting this, uh, this idea of um, yeah, what's pre-planned and what's live and uh, what's what's improv. Um, I think in the process, uh, we were really interested in this um, dual perspective. So using two different cameras to um, manipulate um, the different perspectives that audience will see things. And I think that's definitely something that I will take forward or um, like to push in the live. Um, I think I'm really interested in digital work in terms of using projection. I've always used kind of projection in my work anyway. Um, 
but there's something interesting. I had this kind of idea about how this online performance could then be translated into the live physical performance and what would that look like and would all of the performers actually be sat in the dressing room with a live stream camera um on a screen that the audience watched you know is that is that something that's interesting or is or do we kind of split spaces up so that half of it is live streamed and uh half of it is is physical um yeah so i think this idea of what is uh, mediated and what is a uh, challenging perspective is really interesting. Uh, what do we believe and what do we, um, yeah, take for granted or what do we, what do we go along with um, is really interesting. Um, I like this idea of, uh, I don't know, taking this, uh, this performative normal self forward. And I think that we are kind of constantly performing on these platforms and uh, you kind of forget how to behave um, in real life when you see somebody, um, when you have such a lack of uh, communication with people. Um, so I think if anything, I, t I will take forward kind of the, the beauty of actually being in a room with somebody and uh, being able to work in these ways. And even if they are social distanced, you know, that's also another challenge that is quite interesting. Um, yeah, how do we make performance um, in the same space when <laughs> um, we, we can't go two meters uh, closer? Uh, I will go quickly as we are short on time. Um, I think the biggest thing for me that is kind of more a response to um, global situations and specifically this process, I have been really inspired by um, Forest Fringe's Paper Stages and also partially Ryan Morgan's uh, educational resource. I think you're here. Hi Ryan, if you are. Um, uh, and also just other kind of performance score based uh, work and uh, text-based work because I think w the thing that I am finding the most frustrating is is, is um, that instantly as soon as we've said oh we can't be physically in person with people that has meant everything's on a screen and I think I'm interested in, in, in um, modes of creating performance and creating live art that can exist in spaces that um, are not the screen um because i think it can be quite exhausting um and yeah and so i'm quite interested in um i've recently uploaded uh, one piece onto my website um which was um from my dissertation that i wrote last year um, and i'm in the process of uh compiling a second performance and i'm interested in in, in potentially kind of creating some kind of document or a uh, regular thing that is some kind of a simple Similar to what Paper Stages frames itself as, which is a, a festival disguised as a book. And I think that's a really interesting mode of creating art and something that I'm quite interested in, uh, trying to collate future collaborations with people in a similar regard. And I think that's one thing, I guess, in terms of being a director and working with people, and asking them to create things and then compiling those things back and then kind of uh, moving like a kind of tidal system of like returning inwards and seeing what has been brought up from the sea and then allowing it to run away again, rather than kind of holding onto everything and being in complete control and, and, and like uh, kind of crushing the eggshells in your hands. And um, that was two metaphors at once that didn't really work, uh, but I'll stop talking. <laughs> uh, yeah, very quickly, I think I'm going to look at making more video art. I think that's kind of where I want to go with my practice, especially for right now, when we don't really know what the future is right now so I think that is maybe a good way to sort of yeah develop my practice a little bit and step a little bit into something new um I think also importantly to move away from the idea of like the tortured artist I think I am um, I do that quite a lot I did that quite a lot I'm into the new process of being like I need to do the work and oh it's paining me that I am doing this work because I am an artist and that's that's actually not okay i think that's what this time during covid lockdown whatever has given me the time to look at that in myself and be like no actually just recognize when things aren't aren't good for you and just move away from that and i think that works with 
every way in which I work in terms of autobiography and things. It's like what 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 you putting out there that is not going to be harmful to you. I guess um, like it's our job as artists as makers to to know what what is good and what's not. I guess is what I'm saying. And that also comes into that's material and that is your own mental health as well. I think that is what I'm going to like keep pushing forward. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, um, everyone, for all your beautiful reflections. And thanks to those of you who asked um, questions. Um, so I hope we're going to wrap it up there just because of time. But I hope um, you join us for the rest of the festival. So tonight we have a side scene from Within and Without, which are two sp site specific performances by Craig McCorkadale and Maddie Granland at 7 p.m. this evening. And then tomorrow, on Saturday, um, House by Dan Brown and is on at 7 p.m. followed by Genevieve Jagger's work 12th Net at 8 p.m. And you can also catch all of the directing work again on Tuesday and Wednesday next week from 7 p.m. And you'll find all the information on the RCS website. So thank you very much, everyone, once again for joining us. And I'm going to pass you on to Jen to finish us off today. Yeah, so uh, we started making our work in response, well, um, in the context of one crisis, but we are now in another. Uh, we are all on the panel today, white artists, um, and I think it would feel, um, yeah, ignorant not to, yeah, not to locate our current context. Uh, so we're about to share some links in which you can donate to the Black Lives Matter movement um which should have come up in the chat just now but we yeah we also want to recognize that sometimes making a donation from your own account isn't possible and that the yeah the arts work in quite a yeah quite a low wage um and so we'd like to offer up a link to a youtube video made um by the black lives matter community in which you can stream uh, and that streaming will donate. So what you need to do is you need to click on that video, um, watch it all the way through and do not skip any of the adverts um, because the ad revenue will raise money for um, Black Lives Matter. Um, and that way we can get some money off of YouTube for this and big corporations rather than passing around the same 20 quid over and over again. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us, and I hope to see you um, for the rest of the festival. Bye-bye.